Hey everyone, Wolflord Row here. Today we are discussing the end of the Arx Tyrannus, the doom of Rin's world. General spoiler warning to begin, as today we will be referencing events from across the Warhammer 40k universe, particularly the novels Legacy of Dawn and Rin's World. As always, I really recommend you read the stories for yourself first without spoilers, as that's the best way to enjoy the lore for yourself. But with that said, let's just jump straight in. You know, for all my love of the first founding chapters, there are truly few chapter masters I could rank over the name Pedro Cantor. Ever since I read the novel Rin's World all those many years ago, I just absolutely fell in love with Cantor and his chapter. Easily one of my favourite moments ever, the legendary moment Cantor is faced with delivering the final mercy to a woman who has been desperately carrying her children for miles, just trying to keep up with the Astartes. And instead, he picks her up and carries her, making her a charge of the chapter. It's an absolute goosebump inspiring moment every single time I read it. Absolutely one of my favourite discussions we've ever done on the channel too just representing everything I love about 40k the most. If you haven't read Rin's World, or even if you have, do yourself a favour, go find it on the bookshelf, dust it off, and sit down and give it a read. You really will not regret it. Author Steve Parker delivered an absolute classic that lives on to this day. Now, aside from Cantor himself, equally as an iconic symbol of their chapter is their fortress monastery, the Arx Tyrannus. Or perhaps more appropriately, its destruction. The event that pushed the chapter to the brink of destruction and would define them thereafter, showcasing the sheer stubborn refusal to submit that beats at the heart of all true Sons of Dawn. Now, the destruction of the Arx Tyrannus was one of the most unfortunate events within all of 40k history, wiping out virtually the entire Crimson Fist chapter in the blink of an eye. Over 600 marines. The story is legend, with War Snagrod's invasion descending upon the planet the Arx Tyrannus was to be the bastion of Cantor's defence. However, in the earliest stages of its assault, a missile fired from the fortress, intended for the Greenskin Menace, somehow diverted course and descended back upon the fortress. Plunging deep into the depths, its explosion set off a chain reaction within all the ammunition stores of the chapter destroying their entire fortress in one swift stroke. Where surely their void shields could have protected them from such a strike from orbit, fate had other ideas. Such is the sheer tragedy and incredulity of the event. There is even rumours sabotage must have been responsible, by the Officio Assassinorum no less though no proof has ever been found. Now, recently I dived into the novel Legacy of Dawn for the first time, where I was very pleased to see another viewpoint of this major event. Now, within this story, with the invasion of Snagrod imminent, veteran Sergeant Gallius and his squad were one of the many Crimson Fist units tasked with preparing the world's defence as best they can. In particular for him, the small city of Minessa. Cantor, well aware of the incoming threat, had dispatched many of the chapter veterans to supervise the local defence force, the Rinsgard, in rebuilding or renovating what fortifications they could. And immediately here, this is pretty interesting. 
Because you often perhaps naturally assume that if any world is going to be prepared for an invasion, it would surely be the home world of an Astartes chapter. Perhaps not an intentionally feral world such as Fenris or Chagoris for example, but Rin's world, a chapter in the lineage of Rogal Dawn no less, well then surely that would be. However, Legacy of Dawn actually reveals how ill-prepared the world of Rin's world and perhaps the Crimson Fists were. The Orcs arrived quicker than anyone had anticipated, and with the Void Battle already well underway and raging above the planet, Gallius and his men, like many other squads out there, were still miles away from their intended positions for battle, helping until the very last moment to organise and prepare the defence. And as the Crimson Fists are essentially evacuating, loading up their Thunderhawk to get back to New Rin City, the local colonel of the Rin's Guard was going ballistic. Not through anger, but quite literally fear. Because it's clear how ill-prepared they are. The colonel literally begs Gallius to not go revealing there's defence guns that haven't even been calibrated, and walls not even finished. And there's a really key passage that just sums up what a mess it all kind of is. The time for preparations is past, Gallius replied brusquely. In another hour, perhaps less, the city will be under attack. He keyed the vox speed again. Brother Tauros, I don't see our rhino stored aboard the Thunderhawk. Where in the Black Hells are you? Valentus, Salazar and I are on our way back from the Southern Bastion, Tauros replied. The veteran, a crimson fist of more than 500 years service, sounded entirely unconcerned by the prospect of an impending orc invasion. The regimental engine seers needed a little persuading but we convince them to forego the rights of calibration and let us configure the gun batteries by hand. Chapter Master Cantor expects us in New Rin City right now. But before that, he ordered us to supervise defensive preparations for the city, Taurus pointed out. There's no virtue in leaving a job unfinished, brother, especially not on the eve of battle. Gallius scowled. They'd only had six days to mobilise the local Rinsgard regiments and restore fortifications that hadn't seen use in nearly a thousand years. The Space Marines had pushed the troops hard, working them around the clock to get the city ready. And while they'd performed some certifiable miracles getting the ancient defence systems back online, there would still be a great many crucial tasks left undone by the time the Greenskins arrived. Such was the way of war. If you're not back here in five minutes, you're driving the Rhino to the capital. Understood? So here, with the Orkwa on its way, the chapters had barely six days to mobilise the Rinsguard and prepare the world's fortifications. And the key part here is that they haven't seen use in a thousand years. Now, not seeing use due to no enemy invasion, you may say is a good thing. The chapter doing its job, which undoubtedly it must have been. However, the question maybe does need to be asked here. Did the Crimson Fists and the world of Rin's world for that matter, become complacent. Should it have been such a monumental job to prepare for this incoming enemy? Should the defences have been allowed to reach such levels of disrepair, regardless of the lack of threat? I mean, this is the legacy of Rogal Dawn himself we're talking about here. 
Sure, maybe the phalanx suffered through the centuries after Dawn's departure. But for me, that was more to do with not having the manpower to fill it anymore. A world's defences, for me, are a bit different. I'm a fan of the Crimson Fists, and absolutely commend them for even attempting to prepare the other smaller settlements as best they can. Many chapters out there wouldn't have even bothered. Yet, at least here, Cantor tried to prepare his world as best he could. Which is a testament to the man. However still, although Cantor had only been chapter master around 89 years by this point, should it really have been such panic stations in the face of this assault? Should Rinsworld, its people, its cities, and yes, its chapter, have been more prepared? Let me put it this way. Could you imagine McCrag struggling to renovate its defences before an invasion, even if they hadn't been invaded in a thousand years? I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I can. And so, with Rogel's legacy and blood pumping through the Crimson Fist's veins, I can't help but feel the line of the Crimson Fist chapter masters dropped the ball somewhat here over the centuries. In the grim dark universe, safety can never be taken for granted, even on a chapter homeworld. And so, honestly, it's very surprising to hear how neglected the wider defences of Rinsworld had become, especially again for a chapter of Rogal Dawn's bloodline. As it was, Gallius and his squad would withdraw from Minessa, and it's quite a sombre moment, as the Rinsguard colonel asks how long they need to hold out for despite clearly feeling overwhelmed and crushed by the pressure of what's to come. And Gallius just kind of looks at him, realising how little of war the troops, let alone the people, understand. That the core of the world's defence is going to be the Arx Tyrannus itself, and the capital Nurin City. The rest are just on their own that there will be no help coming for them. How most of these people have never even seen a greenskin, let alone are aware of just what's about to descend upon them. The unbridled massacre that's inevitably going to take place. Minessa, like so much of Rin's world, was doomed to slaughter. And again, it shows how important the Arx Tyrannus was, how focal it was to the entire world's hopes of victory. While so much of the planet would feel the wrath of the Orcs, bear its scars for centuries, the Orcs would instinctually gravitate to the heat of the fighting, the biggest threat, and that of course would be the Arx Tyrannus. Everything was truly tied up in the Fortress Monastery, not simply just the numbers of the chapter. The rest of the world, Nurin City aside, was essentially left to fend for themselves, Cantor knowing the certain truth that they simply couldn't defend it all. And so, aside from simply the loss of numbers the Arx's fall would inflict, it's that focal point, that hub of battle too. In many ways, the fall of the Arx Tyrannus wouldn't just push the Crimson Fists to the verge of extinction, but the world itself too. And as Gallius and his men reached the outskirts of New Rin City, they caught sight of that fateful moment. After a moment, Gallius saw it too. One of the silver contrails was curving, twisting into a corkscrew path above where the fortress monastery stood. For a moment, it looked as though it might right itself and soar skyward. But then, with a final sharp twist, its armour-piercing nose dropped, 
and the missile plunged earthward like a fiery spear. For a fleeting instant, nothing seemed to happen. But then the mountains were limbed in an expanding globe of furious white light. Thousands of meters across, the fireball continued to swell, roiling up into the heavens and darkening to a deep, angry red. A full minute later, the sound of the blast swept over the city, a rumbling roar that swelled in volume until it blotted out the thunder of the city's own guns. Windows shattered across the Zona Regis, and the Space Marines themselves were staggered by the sheer awful force of the noise. It was a sound like the end of the world. Now, this sounds bizarre to say, I know, but I absolutely love this description. Not for the tragedy it inflicts to the chapter, of course, but for how well it's tied in and matches the description we received all those years ago in the Rinsworld novel. The missile corkscrewed in the air above the Ark's Tyrannus for a brief moment. Time seemed to slow down for Cortez as he watched, helpless to do anything. Then the missile plunged deep into the mountainside, its powerful thrusters forcing that armor-piercing nose cone through meter after meter of rock. The mountain shook. Cortez and Rava were thrown from their feet. Shouts of alarm replaced the stutter of gunfire on the air. When the missile reached a depth of 200 meters beneath the rock on which the Ark's Tyrannus stood, it detonated igniting the chapter's ancient underground munition stores, one after another. There was no time to shield oneself, no time to run, nor even to curse. White fire engulfed all and burned to embers the hopes of an entire world. Sometimes in stories retelling events you've seen before, you'll get a change to what you may have always known or a difference that doesn't quite make sense in some way. Yet here, how Legacy of Dawn ties into Rin's world perfectly, you can see and feel that this is Sergeant Gallius witnessing that same event, that notion of the end of the world. Honestly, as a whole, Legacy of Dawn really is an absolutely fantastic read, really being a perfect counterpart to Rin's world. Author Mike Lee clearly wanted to ensure it fit and made sense with the existing narrative, and he did an absolutely great job in making sure it did. It really is a read I recommend, reading the two back to back if you possibly can, Rin's World followed by The Legacy of Dawn. And really, in seeing how ill-prepared the people of Rin's World were, that notion of the Ark's Tyrannus' end, being the end of the world, really does take on that extra meaning, becoming much more literal in a sense. Because the people of Rin's world really had more riding on it than perhaps they should have. Because yes, previously the loss of 600 marines would likely mean certain defeat, but in having been able to see the reality of elsewhere, what else the world had to depend on, which wasn't much, it makes the eventual victory all that much more inconceivable, more staggering for its accomplishment. And a lot of, if not all of that, must go down to not only the resolve and heart of the Crimson Fist chapter, but also the people of Rin's world too, who already faced staggering odds against them. Now we can see for certain how the fall of the Ark's Tyrannus truly did represent the doom of Rin's world. But as always everyone, what do you think? Are you surprised like me to see how far the Rin's world defences had fallen? In not suffering invasion for over a thousand years, do you understand the chapter allowing other defences of the world to fall to disrepair? That it was only the sheer size of Snagrod's invasion that exposed this problem? The fortress monastery itself would usually have been enough. 
Or should the Crimson Fists really have been ensuring all defences of the world were maintained in working order, regardless of the time since they were last needed? Especially considering they knew the true threats out there amongst the Void. Like me, do you see this as extra surprising of an Imperial Fist's successor? Would you expect more of the Sons of Rogal himself? Again, with the fall of the Arx Tyrannus so early in the encounter, and now knowing how little prepared the populace were, does it make the victory at Rinsworld even more impressive than it was before? As always, leave your thoughts in the comments below. Huge thank you to all my subscribers, your support truly means a lot to me, it really does. If you're new, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. And if you enjoyed this particular vid, then why not drop a like on it too? With that said, I am off, and I'll see you all again real soon.